And our Torah portion is Vayitze, uh, which means and went out. Somebody, we might say departed. Um, but one thing, I don't know if you've noticed it about the Torah portions, but if you were to start at the beginning, if you were to start at, say, Bereshit, and work your way forward all the way to Vizot Habercha at the end of Deuteronomy, and you just took the titles of the Torah portions, like Vayetze, or uh, Vayera, or Toldot, you can actually string together the titles of those Torah portions, and it will give you a complete picture of uh, everything from the garden to the resurrection. It will give you the entire plan, like, I don't want to say in a code, because it's not a code, it's, it's too obvious to be a code, but it is something that's frequently overlooked. And uh, maybe sometime I can give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm putting, putting the, the Torah portions with their names in this, um, the revised workbook two that we went over, I think in the reading cycle before last, we used that as an accompaniment um, to go with the Torah portions. And I'm putting the entire list of the Torah portions in there. And then I wanna give the readers an example of, of how that would work, how you can string together and just make a continuing, like a really long sentence or a really long series of sentences with those as the key phrases that give you an entire plan, starting with perfection, going to, um, coming to a place of rest after the fall, um, the process of redemption that begins with Lech Lecha and so forth. And it's pretty amazing that it's built in there, basically just hiding in plain sight. So you could just take the names of the Torah portions and you could tell the plan of salvation, redemption, um, purification, holiness, the complete picture would be there using those almost like an acrostic. You know how you use an acrostic to help you memorize a poem or something? It's kind of like uh, a level of acrostic where you could tell the entire plan. So um, try that sometime. You know, now that you know some of the, the key words, and we're gonna look at one of our key words in this Torah portion is to be asleep. And we know that being asleep symbolizes something, just like we know that the Ola offering symbolizes resurrection. We know that when someone is asleep, it's figurative of death in some way. Now they might be sleeping and they might be in a deep sleep. The deeper the sleep, probably the more prophetically that's going on. But we're gonna see Jacob fall into a sleep in this Torah portion, that's going to be significant in terms of incorporating his experience where he sees the angels of God ascending and descending. Uh, and what a profound impact that it had upon him and why that particular appointment for him was so necessary because of where he was about to go. Because by definition, if you're not in Israel, you're in exile. And so Jacob knows he's about to go into exile. He needs to know what to expect in exile, and he needs to know what is expected of him in exile. Because if we can figure out what was expected of Yaakov when he goes into exile, it's going to let us know what's expected of us what we should be doing until we return to the land itself. So with that introduction, uh, let's see, screen share. Okay. 
Okay, so this is Vayitze, and there's your uh, readings. And for the Big Chadasha reading, I chose 1 Corinthians 15, 42 through 53. But I would suggest reading the entire chapter in context, because what you'll start to do once you, you listen to the, the lesson is you'll pick up on some keywords that Paul's using in the letter to the Corinthians concerning the nature of how man was made. Uh, and what it's going to take in terms of resurrection. Okay, let's see. All right, here we are. And Vayetze, that's what we see. We see Jacob is told to leave the land, which at this point it's not called the land of Israel. Um, it's basically the land of Jacob's fathers, Abraham and Isaac. Uh, it's the promised land. Um, it's a covenant land, but, you know, there's, there's no real assignment yet because they're still basically living like Bedouin. They just pick up and move. They might go to Hebron and to Beersheba, um, they just kind of uh, move apparently wherever the spirit is moving them at that point. But by definition, Jacob's parents know that he's going into exile. Jacob knows that he's going into exile. And because if you're not in the land, you're in exile. Uh, and interesting, I don't know if you remember this, this little bit of trivia. It's been several weeks, I think, since I mentioned it. But, um, you know, in the, the rabbinic point of view, once a person is privileged to return to the land of Israel itself to live. Uh, in, in some streams of Judaism, he's not permitted to leave it. And the one acceptable reason for leaving the land itself is to go find a bride, to go find a righteous bride. Now, I don't know what the context of that comment was. I, I don't remember. It's been too long ago, and I don't even know what book I wrote it in. But that's an interesting commentary in terms of what is an acceptable reason for an Israelite to go into exile, uh, to find a bride. And this is exactly the situation that Yaakov finds himself in. He's about to be separated from soil. And that soil is important. I want to investigate this soil and what makes it so special as opposed to maybe the soil of Beijing or the soil of New Zealand or wherever. There's something about it that is special. And it's so special that being separated from it means you're in exile. That soil means something to a people who come to be called by Jacob's new name, Israel. And that's one other thing I want to draw attention to in this Torah portion, is that people's names change frequently in scripture, and so do place names. So sometimes you're reading about a place, and then you realize, well, this could actually be the same place as this other place, but it's called by a different name. And in this Torah portion, it will literally tell you that this place used to be this place. Um, so that's not uncommon in scripture, and I think that's why a lot of people stay confused. Um, and the way we're brought up, we're either or, A, B, C, or D, true or false. And that's not the way the scripture is written, so it can be frustrating when we're trying to pin down a concept and it seems to move away on us. Uh, but at any rate, this soil means something, something to a people who will be called Israel. And they're going to be required to live and walk by a covenant called the Torah. And the key thing to remember about this people, and it's a, it's a trail I didn't have time to go down, just because of time, you can't cover everything, and this is a long tour portion. But they're also a people betrothed to the Holy One of Israel. Now, it's not that he's not the Holy One of Beijing, He's the Holy One of all the world. But in terms of his holiness, it's usually given in the context of a specific land and people, Israel. 
and they were betrothed at Sinai. And that trail I wanted to go down is an analysis of why the rabbis say that the sulam, the ladder in Jacob's vision, and Sinai are connected. That the two things have a direct connection linguistically or, or more in the gematria of it, but maybe next year. And if you remember last year, we mentioned that if you do Jacob's um, analysis of years, the years that he was in this place, and then the years he was in that place, and then the years he came back to this place, and then the years that he died, or the, the year that he died, then what you come up with is 14 missing years. As you're looking at Jacob's, Yaakov's life. And according to the tradition, those missing 14 years were a time that he served in the house of Ever. Ever. And I'm going to show you that genealogy, not genealogy, it's a timeline, um, approximate birth and death timeline, so that you can see how this is possibly true. Because remember, we had the tradition that Melchizedek was actually another name for Shem and that he resided at Shalem, which once Abraham has the encounter on Mount Moriah with Isaac, and he says basically, yod heh vav that it fixes that uh, Yoreh aspect to the Shalem aspect, and then you get Yerushalayim, uh, that he will make complete. He will see to the completeness in this place. Um, but we know that um, there was a time overlap with Shem and Abraham and Isaac. Now, there would have been a slight overlap with Jacob as well, but Shem would have been very, very, very old, extremely old by the time that Jacob and Esau were born. So tradition tells us that these 14 years between when he deceived Isaac to receive the blessing and when he was actually sent away to Haran, there was 14 years there. And basically he's hiding out in the house of Ever. And um, we can see that there's a possibility uh, that the same way that Isaac sees the pattern, Abraham is sending to Haran to find a bride for Isaac. Isaac knows this. This is where his bride came from, and she's a righteous bride. So Isaac wants the same for Jacob. He does not want Jacob to take a Hittite wife, a Canaanite wife. So he's sending Yaakov, back to the same place to find his wife. And um, why would he have sent him to a there in the interim? What would he have been accomplishing there? The same thing that Abraham and Isaac would have accomplished by going to visit Shem or Machitzedek, where they would learn the statutes and the ordinances. Because remember, the three sons of Noah had very specific uh, blessings or cursings that were placed upon them. And we know that upon Shem uh, was basically going to be the lineage that eventually would produce the Messiah. Shem was going to be the lineage, which Shem means name, um, which we can relate to the place where Adonai says he will put his name, which makes it again another connection to why Shem might have been in Shalem. Uh, at any rate, this was the lineage that was preserving the statutes and the ordinances. Whatever existed up until the time of Noah, which there must have been an incredible amount of knowledge that, you know, even Adam and Eve took out of the garden. But it was up to Shem to pass this on. And so 
it seems, and we'll, we'll look at a, a passage where you can see why they would have thought that that torch was passed on to Aver, as opposed to one of Shem's other sons. It was given specifically to Aver to carry on his work, to be teaching and passing down this, this holy knowledge of the creation. Uh, Genesis 26, 5 indicates even before there was a Torah given at Sinai, that there was commandments, statutes, and laws. And that's why Abraham was chosen, and that's why Abraham was given tip-offs as to future events. He says, because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws, well, how could he keep them unless he was taught? And of course, he may have had direct visitation like Moses, but it's probably more likely that he learned from somebody what the commandments, statutes, and ordinances were particular to his generation. We don't know, you know, if he knew everything in the Torah, but he certainly knew the ethical aspects of the Torah. And so in following this pattern, Isaac might have sent Yaakov to Eber uh, to do the same thing, to learn the commandments, the statutes, and the laws before he goes to Haran to find a wife. In other words, he needs this education before he's really even qualified to select a righteous wife. Uh, otherwise, he might be like Esau. He might just blunder in and, you know, the first woman that looks good is who he's going to marry, even if she is an idolater and a Canaanite. So this is the uh, genealogy from Genesis 10, 21 through 25. And this is why I say there's, there's evidence that whatever Shem knew, he actually uh, passed that baton on to Aver because notice the genealogy. It says, also to Shem, the father of all the children of Ever. Now that is an odd turn of phrase. How could Shem, who was, uh, he can't possibly do that in a, in a literal sense, because it says, uh, and the older brother of Yafet, children were born. The sons of Shem were Elan and Ashur and Arpachshad and Lud and Aram. The sons of Uz and Hu and Geter and Mash. Uh, Arpachshad became the father of Shelach and Shelach became the father of Ever. Okay, you see the distance between Shem and Ever. First of all, generationally, there's a distance between them. But it's saying, Nevertheless, Shem was the father of all the children of Aver. So there's something distinctive about the children of Aver that links them directly back to Shem. So it says, two sons were born to Aver. The name of the one was Peleg, for in his days the earth was divided, and his brother's name was Joktan. So the first point we want to make and we've done this before, we've looked at different examples. When someone is a spiritual advisor or mentor, when someone is going to pass on some anointing um, to someone from another generation, then that person becomes a father to that person, regardless of whether they are a natural relative or simply a spiritual mentor and teacher. You know, two of the easiest examples are going to be Eliyahu was uh, a father to Elisha, even though he wasn't a physical son. And when Eliyahu is taken, El Elisha says, my father, my father, right? And the same thing with Paul. He, he calls Timothy his son. Why? Because they're passing on, you know, anointings of prophecy, anointings as teachers and so forth. So it's suggesting with this turn of phrase here that whatever Shem was doing in terms of 
carrying out the, that blessing that was put upon his line, that it was actually Aver who picked up that, that responsibility to the point that his children were considered Shem's father, or his children were considered sons of Shem in terms of spiritual um, character. Now, one of Aver's sons was Peleg, and that, it says that's when the earth was divided. If you look at the days, we can't really apply it to, you know, when it says the 70 sons of Israel went down to Egypt, and according to their number, the nations were divided. Well, he would have been dead by then, all right? It, it just doesn't work time-wise. Where it does work is the Tower of Babel, which did divide um, the nations. The earth was divided. Um, and, you know, from there, I think we can make that connection to the 70 sons of Israel, uh, which would have been a later division. So first they were divided by language. Uh, and then, in some mysterious way, they're divided according to the 70 people who went from Israel down to Egypt, who went into exile, which there again, that keeps coming up for a reason. Okay, remember this chart? Um, I just wanted you to see here the overlaps. I know it's fuzzy. Uh, in terms of, of course, Shem, like I said, he would have been really old when Jacob was born. But Aver um, has, a, has a pretty significant overlap in terms of the, the missing years, the missing 14 years of Jacob. So it's conceivable that as he inherited Shem's gift of teaching and, and spiritual character, that possibly this is where Jacob, he, he really was, like they say, serving in the house of Aver, which would have been studying, having this, this knowledge passed down to him and this, um, this I, I guess you would say, uh, a knowledge of holiness according to what was understood before the flood. So when he does go to find his righteous wife, that he not only has whatever his parents have passed down to him, his natural parents, he also has what has been passed to him by a spiritual father to help him, to qualify him for making that judgment once he sees the girl that's going to be the one. Here's something else, because again, it's that turn of phrase right there. Shem, the father of all the children of Ever. That is odd. So let's look at the name of Ever. It's from, again, a word that keeps popping up. It's the same root as um, a Hebrew. An Ibri is a Hebrew. It comes from the root Avar. And so Ever is a form of Avar. And it means one who crosses over. And in the case of Aver, the particular structure of it would suggest that he symbolizes the region on that other side to which you would cross over. Now, we, we've understood in lessons past that Avar is frequently a reference to crossing back into the garden. They had to cross out of it. They had to cross the rivers of Eden to get kicked out of it. But in order to go back into the garden, you again have to cross over the rivers of Eden. So using that as a name suggests one who um, would have a way of crossing over. Probably not to the literal Eden, but at, le at least in terms of accessing the commandments, the statutes, and so forth of the word so that there would be an understanding of what it means to cross over and that hope of resurrection, which is crossing over. And to be resurrected into the garden is the whole goal, to be restored to your initial um, plan of creation. Uh, so Remember, again, 14 is the number of the generations of Messiah. We get that out of the Gospels when you start checking 
the generations that led to Messiah, they're in those, um, those increments. But what probably occurred if he was serving in the house of Aver is the development of a more acute spiritual sensitivity. He already has it naturally because we can see that contrast between Yaakov and Esau. But it took something special for him to be allowed to dream a dream that's going to link the heaven of Bethel, the house of God, to Moriah, which is also the house of God. All right? Um, we're only speculating because it's not written in scripture that that's where he went to the house of Aver. But um, one thing we can say did happen in this encounter is that Yaakov, after sleeping, awoke. And when we say awoke, again, that's one of those resurrection words that should get our attention by this point. When someone sleeps, we should know it could be talking about death. And when they wake up, it could be talking about a type of resurrection. So even though he's had 14 hidden years, which is kind of what death does to us, it, it hides us from the physical eye, he could resurrect. He could wake up in the house of God. But then he realizes that, you know what, I'm going to be hidden again. I'm going to be hidden in exile, and I'm going to have to cross back here. Because after all, the crossing activity, the goal of it is to go back to Israel, to go back to the land of promise. So let's read um, Genesis 28. 10 through 22, since that's the main part of our text, or at least the main incident. Um, I'm going to do a blessing. That's a pretty long passage. <laughs> Ashabahar Barami Koha Amin, Benatan Lano with Torato, Baruchata Adonai, no ten hatura. Amen. Okay. It says then Jacob departed from Beersheba, and my little bar here got in the way. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. He had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, the God of Yitzchak, the land on which you lie. I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth. And you will spread out to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone. See, there again. The, the rising early in the morning, that's another resurrection phrase, and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on its top. He called the name of that place Bethel. However, previously, the name of the city had been Luz. When Yaakov made a vow saying, uh, then Yaakov made a vow saying, if God will be with me, 
and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food to eat and garments to wear and I return to my father's house in safety. Then the Lord will be my God. This stone, which I have set up as a pillar, will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Okay, I know I've got in bold some of the words that I want to draw attention to. Obviously, the place, that place, this place, this place, um, that place. That repetition means something. So we're going to have to do our diligence. We're going to have to apply the rule of first mention, and we're going to have to go back to the first mention of the place in order to get the essence of what he's talking about. But since it has raised us now, I mean, I know for a lot of years we read this in a very literal way, but we're talking about dreams. It's elevating this experience to something beyond, you know, walking a dusty path from the promised land to Lebanon or Syria. It's, it's much more elevated than that. When it says Jacob awoke from his sleep, he woke up early the next morning it says he rose, okay? This rising action, uh, sleep as a picture of death. We know that we're reading prophecy. And at some point we have to realize that there is not one single idle word, at least in the Hebrew, in this passage. Everything in here means something. From the idea of the purpose of the journey, which is to find a righteous wife and produce descendants, making a vow, which is what you do at a marriage. Um, everything in here is significant. So obviously we can't figure out what everything means in an hour, but we're going to do our best. So Jacob's mission, if we look at it, it it's not so much to do with his fear of Esau, right? 14 years have passed. And you say, well, how do you know it's been that long? Uh, time, enough time passed between the time that Esau realizes he cannot recover that blessing and uh, having enough time to build up a grudge. And, uh, and that's what it says, that once he realized what had really been done, that, that it was irrecoverable. It says, then he developed a grudge against Yaakov. And then it says, um, he kept it to himself. He didn't tell anybody. But word got to Rivka. So she either got it through this, you know, spirit of prophecy, a dream, a vision, or something. Somehow she knew, even though he didn't say anything, that he intended to kill Yaakov as soon as his parents passed away. He decided, I'm not going to do it while they're alive, but as soon as they pass away, I'm going to kill Jacob. And this grudge in Hebrew is Satan, and I wanted to show you how similar it is. Uh, the, the difference between grudge and basically Satan, which is an adversary. Because Satan means to hate, to oppose somebody, to lay a snare, or to follow them around hostily, like stalking them. And we know that was Esau's nature. He, would, he was a hunter. He would stalk game. Uh, very talented at it. But Satan, if you just go forward one letter in the Hebrew Aleph bait from Mem to Nun, you end up with Satan. Uh, which is the adversary. He's sometimes called like Satan with a proper noun, like where it says with the article prefixed, if you hear hasatan, if you hear someone say hasatan, they mean very specifically an individual um, as an adversary. If you'll remember that the angel that stood in Bilam's way when he was riding his donkey to go curse Israel, uh, he was called a Satan. The angel was, 
Why? Because he was an adversary. He was withstanding Bilam on his journey. So I don't really even know what my point was there, but for you to see how close sometimes Hebrew words, if they're kind of sound alikes, uh, sometimes you get a similar definition. So that 14 years was probably uh, a cooling off period, you know, for Esau as well. And of course, at some point, Rebecca uh, realizes that Esau has not cooled off. Instead, he has developed a pretty serious grudge and that he intends to kill Jacob. And that's when she and Isaac call Yaakov in and send him away uh, to go find a righteous bride. And the language, if, if you pay attention to what's going on, even though it's a long narrative in the Torah portion, you realize um, all of that is in the context. There's like a little interruption in the text about Esau because it's only at that point when they call Yaakov in and say, it's time for you to go find a wife. And don't you dare take one of these Hittite women. You will not marry a Canaanite. Um, that's when Esau realizes what a big deal it was for him to marry the Hittite women and how angry and upset they were about it. And it's that point we are told in the text that, um, oh, you know, let me go get a daughter of Ishmael. Maybe that'll make up for things. And that could have. But when an Israelite marries an idolater, where there is no repentance, where there is no change of nature, then they are obligated to divorce that wife. We see that later when the Jews come back from Babylon, that when they had wives who would not repent of idolatry, they were told to divorce them, to put them away. And so Esau makes one step in the right direction, but he doesn't show total repentance, which was our point last week, how he's one of, another hopper, you know. He can have great intentions, but then he just never puts it all together in the same place at the same time. Uh, so let's look at this particular place. Uh, well, it's the place too. Let's look at this verse about the place where it says, he came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay down in that place. So basically we have the use of the word makom three times in one sentence. And we know of course that three is a resurrection marker. And I put it there in the Hebrew so that you could see a couple of things. First of all, the three uses of makom. You know, first it says uh, bamakom, then it says hamakom, then it says bamakom again. So you've got three uses there. But I also wanted you to notice the verb because the English does not do justice to what actually happened. Because in English, it tells us he came to a certain place. That is not what he did. That is not what that Hebrew word says. It, it would be, you know, a different form, obviously, of Bo, right? Bo is come and go. But this is a very specific Hebrew verb. It says vayifga. And vayifga or yifga, it means to encounter something. It's, it's not a casual word. It's, it's much more powerful in terms of describing the action than bo. So when paga, when you hear that, uh, you know that something, again, more active is happening. It means to encounter something, to meet somebody to reach a certain place that, you know, there was a specific goal. It, it wasn't a random thing. Uh, it can mean to make intercession. Um, it can also mean to touch a boundary. 
which is important because we know that Yaakov has walked into a place that is a different region. You know, if you want to look at Ever's name as meaning, you know, that region on the other side, well, definitely Yaakov has an encounter with a different region. He's touched a boundary when he decides to uh, spend the night in the place, Hamakom. So with the positioning of, of Yavayifka, we realize that even before he goes to sleep and has the dream, even before he wakes up and realizes what the dream is, that he has had an encounter prior to those two things even before the dream and the awakening, even before death and resurrection, he has an encounter. And if you've ever been to Israel, or if you've been more than once, you realize this is very frequently the case. It happens to me um, every single time I go. Every single time I go, at some point, I will know specifically why I went, but it may not be for months after I return, which is actually kind of backward. Because if you go to Israel, you're returning. <laughs> and if you come back home, you're going back into exile. But when you come back home, that's when your spirit has a chance to really process things. And you really only get it in hindsight. So something has happened to Yaakov even before this most powerful event of the dream and the realization. And then he realizes in hindsight, oh, and, and we're not really told what the encounter is. Um, did he see something? Did he feel something? What happened? We don't know what the encounter was. We don't know what exactly he touched except of course you know he stepped into another realm of the spirit and like i say if you go to israel that's typically what happens in hindsight you will realize what encounters you had but typically you don't necessarily get when you have the encounter the impact of it So the mission he's on is marriage. And he can see in the dream that that mission is being affirmed because he's promised descendants. You, you don't get descendants unless you're Esau's son, Eliphaz, who just, you know, took Timnah and ended up with Amalek. All right. Um, she was not a wife. But... When the mission is marriage, then ultimately, you know, the long-term goal is going to be not just children, but for Yaakov, he needs to find a godly wife so that he can father godly children. Uh, and so to enable him to feel affirmed, I believe, in the mission, like he's on the right path and that, you know, Adonai is not going to leave him in the exile alone. He's going to go with him. He has to encounter, remember Vaivka, he has to encounter, he has to touch a boundary of the Makam, the place. And I thought this is an excellent description of the place. So I just had to put the quote in here for you. It says, Makam is a gateway to heaven that spans the void between the physical train beneath his feet and the heavenly world, the spiritual and transcendent spheres beyond this world. Yako's vision is almost unfathomable, for he describes spiritual structures that transcend the physical, yet have a physical manifestation. So, we have this rock, which apparently means something to him. And then we have the ladder, which means something to him. But who knows exactly what he truly encountered in the ladder and in the rock? 
he's touched something. He's touched a boundary there that has transformed his vision. And it's very difficult, Rabbi Khan is saying, for us to even fathom what he saw. You know, it's like Ezekiel's vision. He's doing the best he can to describe it. But for us as the reader, it's really difficult to see exactly, because probably if you're like me, you know, you read a, a children's storybook of Bible stories, or your, your little children's Bible had pictures in it, and Jacob's ladder to you is exactly whatever was in that first picture you saw of it. But it, it's not that. It's, it's something much more powerful because he's terrified. He's afraid when he wakes up. So, and I don't do this much. And I don't encourage you to do it much because people get carried away with it. And then they end up not speaking in a known tongue. Uh, people get fascinated with the Hebrew letters and especially the Paleo Hebrew letters. But if you start trying to do this with your Christian friends, they will not understand a word you're saying and they will think you've lost your mind or at worst that you're just very boring. Uh, but if you do know the Hebrew letters, then you can read a little bit of Hebrew. I think it's very useful because a word itself will sometimes help you to get a grasp of the word's essence. It'll, it'll be like a memory device is what I would call it. And so I just took the word hamakom for the place. Because remember, hamakom, according to Yaakov, is the Shemaim, right? It's the gateway to the Shemaim. So if we take the first letter of hamakom, it's the definite article, the. It's the the in the place. And when you put the definite article in front of it, it means the one and only. It's designating, it's, it's giving it specificity. In other words, there's only one place, which I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stir that around a little bit when we try to figure out exactly where Beitel is. And is, there, is it possible there's two Beitels? Or are those two Beitels actually one Beitel? And if they're one, then how did they get to be one when they're in two separate places? We'll look at that. The first actual word of Makom is Mem. And if you've uh, looked at the letter, you can see it, it designates like water. The, the Paleo Hebrew, it looked much more water-like. You could actually see the flow of the water. Um, the modern Hebrew, it's basically representing water, but you can see inflow, like there's a little spout up there where water can pass through. And that's the exact midpoint of the Aleph bait in Hebrew. It's the center of the Aleph in the top. Right? When you add mem to aleph and tav, you end up with amet, which is truth. Right? So when he says, you know, I'm the beginning and the end, he's also the middle because he is truth. The next uh, letter is a kof. And if you look in 2 Chronicles 9.21, you can see that the, the kupim are apes or monkeys. And you say, now wait a minute. There's no monkeys in the temple. Uh, <laughs> when's the last time we saw an ape in the temple? Like, well, think about that. But at any rate, an ape is an animal that mimics. It, it likes to imitate things. So kuf is the first letter of holiness, kadosh. And the essence of holiness is be holy, for I am holy. In other words, it's, I have made you to be in my image. And so when we see a kuf, we get the idea that it's, it's something that would conform to the image, would conform to the will, would conform to the, the spiritual authority of the Holy One. Next is a vav, which is a connector. It literally means and. And you'll hear it affixed to many of the Torah portions, like Vayikra, Vayitze, Vayela, Vayishlach. And in Hebrew, it's not like an English class where you get in trouble if you start a sentence with and. In Hebrew, it's perfectly okay. 
right? Because it will connect you to the previous concept. Uh, Hebrew is less concerned about disconnecting ideas. It's much more fluid. Uh, literally, it's going to be a nail or a peg, uh, some sort of object that's designed to connect two things. In the tabernacle, it would have connected um, basically the upper and the lower realms because the vavim are like these little connector pegs uh, for the size of the tabernacle, like the, the hangings and stuff. But it also represents a man. You see, it looks it even looks like a man with his head kind of bent over. Uh, but both man and beast were created on the sixth day. It's the sixth letter. And so it can also represent, at least symbolically, a human being. And then the last letter is going to be a final man, which is sealed up. It's closed in. And it's it would occur if a mim shows up at the end of a word, then you use a sofit. You use the closed up form of the letter. Uh, so it has a final sealing up aspect to it. When you put those individual meanings or symbols together with hamakon, we have a definite place. It's a place where there is flowing water. It's a, it's a place between the Aleph and the Tav. It has an essence of holiness. That holiness can be attached to a human being, to a man. And it can be sealed up as a final letter, as an end goal at a future time. So let's go to our first mention. This is just so exciting. I know I don't look excited, but I am excited. Um, this is Genesis 1-9, the first time we see Makom. It says, then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And I put the Hebrew sentence there for you. Because again, there's words I want you to pay attention to. Of course, in bold, there's makom, and makom echad, to one place. But I wanted you to see also hamai. Because remember, there's two mayims in makom. There's, there's two symbols of water. But, and this is, this is crazy good. The first mention of Makam is not just in relation to water, it's in relation to the gathering of the waters. And that's why I put not just in bold, but I put it in blue to set it apart. There where it says, Yikve'u. Uh, now you know the word mikvah, all right? It's, it's the same root except um, this is more of the imperative form of the word, whereas a mikvah is going to be a noun construct. Uh, so the first mention of the makom, the place, is going to be in relation to the gathering of the waters under the heavens, under the shemaim. And you can even hear water in shemaim, in heavens. It's just sheen, uh, which can symbolize ash, which is fire, but shame by itself uh, can mean teeth or ivory. And maybe coincidentally, maybe not, Solomon's throne was made of ivory. So the king's throne is associated with ivory. So it's a type of authority picture there, if you break down the, the letter. So it's, it's an authoritative water. So ikbe'u is the same root as mikvah. And you know, a mikvah or a gathering of waters is necessary. If you've had contact with the realm of death, then you have to immerse in a mikvah. If you plan to enter those inner precincts of the house, of the temple, then you have to mikvah. 
in order to be ritually prepared to cross in there. So the gathering of the water is the mikvah. The place of the gathering is makom. All right, that's important. If you take notes, which I'm getting, you get the PowerPoint, so I guess you get, need to take notes. But in terms of understanding this whole thing, because our first mention gives us the GPS, when we're trying to figure out exactly what Yaakov is talking about when he talks about hamakom, 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 bamakom, the gathering of the water is the mikvah. The place of the gathering is makom. Okay. So here's a picture um, around the temple. There's an excess of 200 of these mikvahot, or ritual immersion uh, baths. They're not, you know, to take a, a bar of Irish spring and jump in, you should already be clean when you go in there. Um, but you're there simply to pass through the waters so that when you come up out of there, you are like dry land emerging from the gathering, the mix of the waters. And so not just around the temple precincts did they have so many mikvahot, but on the pathways going into Jerusalem, like on the path of the patriarchs, there's a, a pretty good size mikvah where you can like go down on one side through one opening and then come back the other. So that there's a lot of wide space. So if you're coming up ritually clean, then you're not randomly brushing up against somebody who has yet to go down in there. Um, so we've got dry land emerging from the gathering of the place. And we know that water is a symbol of the spirit. So we have man emerging from the dust of the ground he is a kind of a hybrid. I don't know if I like that word, but I can't find a better one. He is a kind of a hybrid creation of both the spiritual and the physical worlds. And it's not just any dust of the earth that is used. Uh, because, you know, there's sand probably underneath the gathering of waters. He could have used the sand beneath the sea, but he didn't. He used very specific dust of the earth. He used the earth that emerged from the makam, from the place. So if we just ride with Jacob a little bit and we connect the dust of the place to a specific place, in his case, a place called Beit El. But we also know that Moriah is also called the place. Then we know that man was formed from the earth, the dust of the earth that emerged from Hamakon, the house of El. Man, Adam, was formed from the Adama, the earth of the house of God. And so what's the message here? He was to bear an image. He was made in the image of Elohim. So in terms of his formation, he has an earthy image. But he also has this heavenly spiritual image that counterbalances that earthy beginning. And, and that's the, the message we get out of Targum Yonatan. Um, in the commentary or in the translation, the, the Aramaic translation from Genesis 2-7, he says that the dust that man was formed with was gathered from the place where the Beit HaMikdash would stand. That's how he's interpreting that passage. That that specific dust 
that is our substance. Its origin was from Hamakom, from the place where later the Beit Hamikdash would stand. And why would the Beit Hamikdash stand there? Because it's representing on earth something that actually exists in the heavenlies. And so it's, it's representing, at least to mankind, who fell from the garden, that when you see this physical temple and you walk in the dust of the earth of this physical temple, it makes you think about how you were formed and why you were formed to begin with. And why your goal shouldn't just be to go and offer sacrifices in this place in just an earthly physical sense, but your ultimate goal should be to offer thank offerings in the place, the temple above. One represents the other. One keeps your, your focus on the other. It was never intended for you to look at the temple and say, oh, how marvelous this temple is. What a wonder, you know, what a wonder of the world. How could human beings have done something this beautiful? It was never intended to be just that. It was intended for you to look at that temple and think of your resurrection when you would awake. And you would realize that you had had an encounter that was going to enable you to pass and to cross over into that original place of the place that would far outshine anything a human being could build on the earth of a place. And so now our time's up. But I think this is, we can close with 1 Corinthians 15, 42, at, at least until tomorrow, because we've got some spectacular places to go on this journey with Jacob. Uh, but Paul explains it in, in very much this rabbinic interpretation of how man was formed and where his true home is and why it hurts so much, or it should, why it hurts so much to be in exile, because you are separated from your place, from your place of origin. So Paul says, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body. It is raised an imperishable body. He's referring back to the original bodies that Adam and Chava had in the garden. He says, basically, now it's sown in dishonor, but it's raised in glory. See, raised there, there's our resurrection language. It's sown in weakness. It's sown in, in an earthy body, but it's raised in power because resurrection is associated with the spirit of Gvura, which means power. And that's what Yeshua said, remain in Jerusalem until you have received power from on high, that, that same spirit that resurrected Yeshua from the dead, that same spirit of power, he says, I'm going to put that in you in order to enable you to go and preach that good news, that you can be resurrected into the garden. He says it's sown a natural body. It's raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body, which goes back again to the gathering of the waters, the dry land of the place emerges, and then the breath of Elohim, the spirit of Elohim, gives you that heavenly aspect of your creation. He says, so also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. And by the way, the soul is formed in the lower parts of the earth, according to the psalm. However, the spiritual is not first, but the natural, then the spiritual. And that's exactly what happened. Adam was formed, and 
he had a body, he actually had a soul, but it wasn't a living soul until Elohim breathed spirit into him. That's exactly what sets him apart from the, the creatures, the, the beasts. The first man is from the earth, earthy. The second man is from heaven. As, the, as is the earthy, so also are those who are earthy. And as is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we have borne the image of the earthy, because we all have a body, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. What is he saying? Look, you can't just march into the garden in this body of flesh. But he says, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep. Remember, sleep is a metaphor of death. We will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, which is going to be Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, because the great trump is Yom Kippur. But the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. So you see, he's not saying, you know what, we gotta get rid of this nasty old corruptible body. He's saying this nasty old corruptible body is actually going to be changed so that it can be restored to the garden in the way that it was originally intended. Like Jacob is seeing, I'm seeing something that I'm putting in earthy terms, but what he is seeing is something in the spiritual realm. So in tomorrow's class, we're gonna to try to unpack exactly what was going on in that place. And, um, how he could, how we can look at the place and decide, we don't have to decide, but we can look at two different aspects of the place. Whether we're talking about Jerusalem as Hamakom, Mount Moria, or whether we're looking at a different location. Let's see if I've got it up here. I think it's later. Okay. Um, that we can also identify as Beit El, and I'll show you pictures of it tomorrow, um, because that particular Beit El is near a place called Ai, and I've got pictures of both of those places I can show you. But how could he be in the place here, but also be in the place there? Well, the rabbis have an interesting take on that. And, um, We'll see. That's one of those things I'll, I'll have to put the information out there and, and let you make a decision. But uh, this is an exciting Torah portion when we take it up a level. When we let those key words like sleep, uh, awake, arise, especially when he arises early in the morning, uh, that's a big tip. We're getting these GPSs. When we, when we see where our substance began, I mean, that's incredible. I mean, I can't see all of you. Some of you don't have your, your cameras on, but the ones I can see, how many of you would like to be in Jerusalem right this second? Because you know where you were born. That's your birthplace. That's the birthplace of mankind, the place, the dust of the place. And then he breathed his spirit into us. And so in exile, he tells us, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. That's the same thing that Adonai told Jacob exactly what Yeshua said. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you until I bring you back and fulfill everything that I have promised you. You are going to have a holy spouse. You are going to have holy children. 
and they are going to be restored to the place and they will bring thank offerings into my house. And uh, it, I say I got excited today studying because I started to make these connections with Isaiah and Ezekiel where it talks about the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride and what it really means and, and why our hearts are connected to that land. Even if we've never been there, our hearts are connected because that is truly home. Even if he sends us out to accomplish something, even if he sends us out to find a holy spouse, even if he sends us out to, to have children, to bring back, isn't that all part of prophecy? That your children are going to be carried back to? Your children are going to be taught of the Lord? Well, that's all part of it. The exile is not a place that we just have to settle for. It's a place where we're preparing for the return. Because in tomorrow's lesson, I was hoping we'd get that far, but we won't tonight. There's a strange thing that's written about the house of Joseph and Bethel. It's strange. It doesn't fit the context of all the other tribes and what they're doing. The house of Joseph, even though Judah had already conquered Jerusalem and burned it, for some strange reason, it doesn't say Menashe, it doesn't say Ephraim, because they're all out conquering their little territories in Joshua 1, right? But it says something odd. It doesn't say Ephraim. It doesn't say Menashe. It says the house of Joseph went to Beit El. And they saw a man coming out of the city and asked him where the entrance was. Now, does that make any sense to you? If you see somebody come out of a city, you're like, dude, come over here. How do we get in there? You know how to get in there. He just walked out of there. And you're going to ask him, how do I get in there? Unless something strange is happening. Something Jacob-like is happening. Because it, they found the entrance. They found the way in after Judah. But it doesn't say they stayed there. You know, it's just... It's a strange thing. It's like, okay, Judah found it. Now the house of Joseph found it. Now we go on about our tribal business. This is incredible. Has anybody ever seen this before? I mean, I don't know. Um, well, like, there's something going on here with this Badel, the house of God. And um, it's just like, a, I mean, I have, I've read this Torah portion, but I have never read it like this year, where I'm just like, Psh! Let's take this up a level. Let's try to see what Jacob saw in the place. And once you start using the rules and going back to first mention, you realize why he would be so afraid to leave and to go into the exile. But don't be afraid of your exile. He's going to give you food to eat. He's going to give you clothes to wear. You're going to be fine. And when you come back to the place, you're going to have so much more than you left with. You're going to be blessed. And, and your children and your children's children are going to offer thank offerings in the house of the Lord. You can write it down, sign it, seal it up, because it's in the Word. And by the way, I just want to thank Tyler for praying Wednesday night. I was, I was in agony <laughs> last week. <laughs> and after you prayed, it wasn't instantaneous. I'm still hobbling around. But little by little, I was able to walk. Um, and I can get myself up and down now. Um, you know, uh, it's, it's not dramatic. 
but it's steady improvement. Um, so, cause I didn't think it was just, you ever just hurt so bad you think I'd rather just run my head into a wall than put up with this, <laughs> but I wouldn't run it anywhere. <laughs> Uh, but thank you. You know, when we pray for one another, it makes a difference. It really does. So thank you. And, you know, tell ROL thank you too, because I couldn't have taken another day or two of that.